So welcome everyone and welcome Amina. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's seminar of the Synap series. It's the first time we've had a seminar based in North Africa or Africa in general. And also I think it shows that in choosing the word synapse, which was supposed to symbolize bringing things together from a range of fields, uh, maybe we should have chosen the term the family meal uh, because we, uh, both in Seychelles and across the campus, in conceptualising this series, we wanted to bring people together from a lot of different backgrounds to talk about things that interest us in common. And it can sometimes be hard to tear people away from their specialist niches uh, to get together. And the topic that we're going to be hearing about today, I think, uh, does that in a very interesting way. Just to say a few words of introduction about uh, Amina. She uh, is Professor of Berber Studies in uh, Paris and also at Lacan, which is uh, the, uh, the Seminar Centre uh, focusing on studies of, of uh, Africa. She's worked across a very broad range of fields, uh, one part of them being an exploration of her own heritage as a Kabyle uh, speaker through, through her father. Uh, one part of them focusing on more directly linguistic topics, including prosody and uh, construct state and grammaticalization, a, a lot of uh, issues like that. One part of it being the, the building of uh, some beautiful uh, cross-linguistic corpora, including a first corpus of Afro-Asiatic languages, and a second one which has a, a broader uh, sample of languages. And if you want to sort of Google those after, uh, there's, there's some really interesting things and aspects of corpus design there. But uh, one final element in what she does is developing an approach to language documentation uh, that is auto-documentation, bringing in speakers to uh, document languages themselves, because I think in the crisis of language loss that we face, uh, linguists themselves aren't going to be able to do it. You know, we, we have to be handing over the task or uh, bringing into the task the, the energies and knowledge and passion of uh, speakers themselves, and Amina has been doing a lot on that. So I think uh, several of those strands that I mentioned will touch on uh, what we're going to hear today, and uh, without further ado, Welcome again, Amina. Thanks for coming, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Chris, for inviting me to this uh, Synapse uh, seminar, which um, I am really happy to um, to be talking uh, in. So, um, as Nick said, the topic of the talk will be cooking across time and space, but first of all I would like to acknowledge the Ngunawal and Gambri people who are the traditional custodians of this land, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians present. So now to another indigenous area which is uh, situated in the north of Africa, and I will first present an overview of um, this area. Uh, on the left, from the point of view of uh, vegetation, and on the, life, on the right, from the point of view of climate, you can see that the, the area is in blue. It's quite um, huge, from the Mediterranean to the Sahel, and from the Canary Islands to the Nile. Um, now people and landscapes, so you can also have an idea of the variation. Uh, top left you have Kabylie in Algeria, which is in the north. Then uh, top right, the High Atlas in Morocco, a little bit further down. Uh, then bottom left, Wargla, it's in the northern Sahara in Algeria. So this. Um, illustrates one kind of also of ecosystem within the whole area, which is the oasis. A lot of Berber languages are spoken in oasis. A lot of them also, as shown there, in the mountains in the north. And uh, right, 
uh, bottom right the Hogar Mountains in Algeria, which represent the southernmost um, Berber um, population and ecosystem. So mountains again, but in the in the desert, in the dunes and the and the sand. Since you, you also have pictures of people there. So across time, Berber is a branch of the Afroasiatic phylum, and uh, you have here one possible branching hypothesis with possible time frames. Uh, this is just one among many possibilities. This, we, we're not sure about anything uh, at the moment. So the first divergence is reconstructed at at least 2,000 years before present, and the point of origin is, in, is uncertain. Some hypotheses uh, put forward the Horn of Africa, others the Levant, others Eastern Sahara. So I'm not going to uh, focus on this. This is just a uh, background for introducing the Berber languages themselves, which um, are spoken on that area. You'll see that map on the top right quite often during the talk. So I'm just... Um, I just want to uh, explain the colors which correspond to the subgroups within Berber. So the subclassification is mainly geographic for the moment. Again, um, there are a few issues which are under discussion. Uh, so you have the West and the South Berber languages, which are the f correspond to the first branching. And this is the, the West Berber, it, there's only one. Uh, representative of that subgroup, which is uh, there on the bottom left, the tiny orange um, dot there. Okay. Then you have uh, the South Berber languages in yellow, and then the nor Northern Berber in blue, and Eastern Berber in pink. Uh, a short note on Berber morphologies. This, this is not going to be a heavily linguistically loaded talk, at least not um, at the level of uh, studies on particular items. Or, but I need to, to tell you about the, the fact that Berber is based on a root and pattern morphology uh, with consonantal roots. You have an example here of Hures or Elif, which express the idea of plowing or and the, for the other one of happening or, or an ordeal and then you have vocalic templates and uh, the root and pattern morphology uh, works in the following way so you have for instance for the root hires with um, a vocalic pattern hires in the perfective as opposed to hires in the negative perfective and for nominal patterns you have for the root luf teluf a singular tilufa plural other uh, point I would like to uh, make is about um, specifically nominal morphology. Uh, for instance, you have the root vizin, uh, for the stem, the stem would be bazin, bazin, depending on the pronunciation of the region. And the state, you have, generally speaking, a, a state prefix, so here a, which is masculine, a bazin, and then the feminine is usually a circumfixed t, um, all, uh, all of the time a prefixed one and most of the time a uh, suffix one, so thevezit. So this is basically all you need to know to follow the talk today. So across time, ancient populations, um, anatomically modern humans are known to have been present in North Africa during the Middle, middle Paleolithic, uh, as attested by the Jebel Irwood Homo sapiens. Uh, a few words on DNA, but I'm absolutely not a specialist on this, but apparently there's a long-term genetic continuity in the region uh, with an endemic component retained in present-day Maghribi populations. And um, we have uh, in that region three, two uh, major cultures, Neolithic cultures. One of them is Ibero-Mauritian from 19,000 approximately or 20,000 to 10,000 BP. The, those are represented um, on the map by the green zone there. And you have the Capsian culture, 12,000 to 8,000, which is here in blue. Uh, and 
the arrival of Afroasiatic groups might have happened around 9,000, 8,000 BP if we consider um, the reconstructions that I presented at the beginning uh, plausible. So I'll go through the various invasions very quickly because they're not, they don't concern directly my talk. Uh, all the food um, borrowings, terms or recipes and everything are mostly borrowed in city cuisine or cooking. So I'm going to focus on rural and very simple traditional preparations. So the Phoenicians, during the reign of the Phoenicians, there were Numid kingdoms, so local kingdoms uh, from the fourth century BC to uh, the beginning of our era, then the Romans, then the Vandals, then the Byzantine Empire, then the Arab conquest, then the Barbaro Andalus dynasties, so local dynasties um, which spread to uh, Spain and so on, then the Ottomans, and then the Western <coughs> colonizations until the 1960s. But now back to uh, more ancient periods, I would like to first uh, present food in prehistory and its relevance in relation to language. So uh, a few words about very ancient times, Paleolithic. Um, in that period, we have traces of cuts by lithic objects on animal bones, which indicates scavenging, probably as, all of, as is the case all over the world. And then for more recent periods, um, hunting and gathering, especially for the Ibero-Mauritians, shells, seashells and snails. So that those are the ones on the green part uh, along the shore of the Mediterranean. Uh, in that region, the teeth that were found show uh, where due to mastication of bulbs or ground grains, probably. The first potteries um, can be dated back to 10,000 BP in the Sahara. So we wonder if maybe they were used to eat gruels, prepare gruels and porridges. As for the captions, so the more recent civilization, the, the ones that's inside um, Algeria, hunting and gathering, and they are characterized by massive, what we call escargotière, I don't know what the term is, is shell midden. Shell midden. 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 Okay. Uh, so in uh, Kangat and Muhad, uh, 320 million shells, so those are really huge. Um, quantities and in one of the, yeah in one it's, it's so it's really absolutely huge and in another uh, of those is um, an oven was found made of superposed heating stones allowing probably the cooking of massive quantities of snails perhaps for conservation of course all this is very tentative and for the introduction of domestic cattle this is um, probably has been um, done around 7,000 BP. So hunting, gathering, and pastoralism, agriculture, cohabited for much longer than in Europe or in the Levant due to climatic con conditions. And um, studies show that pastoralism preceded by far the domestication of plants. So people went on having herds and gathering and hunting for quite some time. Uh, those are examples of three tra trajectories in Holocene North Africa. So from uh, in Saharan Africa, uh, that's the pink uh, circle spread for, from Eastern Sahara to the Akakus in Libya and the, to Chad, the Chad Mountains. Uh, so ca cattle, plus or pastoralism plus white plants, hunting and fishing. Then you have the Sudanic Nile in green, uh, where you have large semi-permanent pastoralist camps with cattle domesticates and the Mediterranean with broad spectrum hunting and gathering, um, which was continued in parallel with herding afterwards. So an example from a cave which is in north uh, northern Algeria in Kabylie, so in the region uh, I'm from and about which I'm going to talk later. 
um, this cave uh, has remains that have been found and belong to four different periods that you have on the right there. Um, and one of the interesting things about animal remains are that you um, domestic sheep and goats were found, remains were found there, dated from 7000 BP. And there were a few bovines, but first there were wild ones and then domesticated, some suets, pigs and wild, wild boars, and other wild species which probably correspond to hunting uh, process. So um, one thing through which one, we can understand what people eat or what, what they consume is through uh, the remains of those animals. So if you have massive killings of young and sub-adult males, this means that uh, this was mostly used for meat, so f for meat consumption. But if you have massive killings of young lambs before two months, then it means that it's mostly the milk which was um, used um, at that uh, place. So for Gendaman, for this uh, cave, uh, the, f the beginning of the occupation corresponded to mostly um, consumption, meat consumption of those uh, sheep and goats, and then it went on to a mixed meat and, and milk diet. Uh, quickly about the ceramic uh, assemblage. What's interesting there is that the majority appear to be cooking vessels. Uh, in one of them, uh, given the, the, the size, that's what the um, authors of the paper that I'm going to uh, reference on the next slide um, conclude. And uh, there, are, there is a strong co correlation between charcoal and ceramic concentration and high ketone levels, which show that those vessels have been heated uh, above 300 degrees Celsius. So probably that's why they, I mean, that's why they consider that it's uh, cooking. Fatty acids show that animals subsist mainly on C3 plants, that is temperate plants, but also some arid plants. So uh, what happens uh, in, so when I say Tamazra, it means the whole of the Berber area. That's the local name for it. So despite separate pa pastoral trajectories, uh, the exploitation of milk and milk products occur contemporaneously in both Mediterranean and Saharan North Africa. However, sheep and goat are first at Geldaman Cave, so in the north, and cattle first domesticates in Saharan Africa, followed by sheep and goats once the region became more arid. So now if we go down to the Sahara, to, to the southern Sahara, there are, as you probably know, a number of uh, extraordinary rock art uh, sites there, which uh, feature um, animals, domesticated animals. So I just gave you a few um, um, photos of those Rock, of this rock art. Uh, bottom left, you have um, a bovine. Then you have small cattle. That's the Iheran period, which I'm going to talk about further on. Then introduction of the horse and introduction of the camel, which was really very far in time. So the domestication of uh, big cattle, bovines, probably <coughs> began in the east and as shown by the dates, uh, then uh, moved to the west on, in the area. Nowadays, cattle herders are not Berber, uh, big cattle, bovine herders are more Fula people, so belonging to other groups uh, than Berbers who are mostly small uh, cattle herders. So here you have a uh, rock art which is very interesting in the Tassili, so 6,000, 3,500 before present, Iheren. Uh, this shows evidence of a migration, Mediterranean migration to the Sahara. Uh, and uh, you will see that, oh, you can see that probably those people had um, a milk economy which was quite uh, important and this is what I'm going to focus 
right now. Uh, in Berber, depending on the regions, there are two terms in contemporary Berber, two terms for milk. You have Ari and its cognates on the one hand, and Ekfe and its cognates. So Ari, uh, you can see it's um, mostly there, okay, and Ekfe is there. Um, and it happens that uh, those, the first type of cognates, all are used as, as the main term for milk in oases or in the Sahara, so in arid zones, hot zones with a hot climate. So milk quickly curdles and you need to pre-prepare the milk in a certain way. Uh, and this word, Ari, or this cognate, also exists in northern Tamazra, but in more temperate climates, but there it only refers to the buttermilk. Uh, conversely, Akfe is used as the main term for milk in the north, in temperate mountains, and uh, in the south, this term exists, but it means fresh milk, which is a se secondary product. So the two terms exist in the whole zone, but the choice of the base term is linked to the ecosystem, which influences the initial processing of the milk. You also have different types of churns uh, across the whole area. You can see on the left goat skin churns, in the middle pottery churns, and on the right squashes. And um, those squashes, um, as you can see on the left, are used in temperate climates, for instance Kabylie. It leaves, uh, so first you leave the fresh milk in a clean earthenware pot, then you collect the cream, then you churn the milk in a squash, yielding fresh butter. You keep the buttermilk as a drink, which is, quite, is not used every day, uh, and you melt some of the butter for cons conservation, and there's an Arabic loan word for that, which is smen. In arid climates, so in the southern Sahara, you put the milk to ferment for 12 hours before, hand in a special goat skin, which is unwatched and contains b bacteria. Then you transfer it into another goat skin, then what? the uh, actual churn, and then you churn the milk, and then you yield butter, butter, udi wemelin, which means uh, butter which is white. This one is used only for medical purposes, and most of the butter is melted, um, udi, and um, mixed with aromatic plants for conservation, and only little milk is kept fresh. And the butter milk is a drink which is often extended with water and is used um, extensively in that in that area. So this is also to show that if uh, that it's important, I think, to go beyond uh, looking at cognates and really see exactly what they refer to to understand how this. Um, works and how this um, goes in the whole area. So the manchurn types, the goatskin type is the one in blue, and you can see that it's the main churn which is used geographically, whereas the other ones are quite peripheral. Uh, but as you see, the, the goatskin is used in the south, but if you remember that um, picture I showed you a few slides earlier of the Iheran in the Tassil in the southern Sahara, uh, rock art, you can see that there are a few squash uh, vessels there which look very similar to the ones we have um, in the north of Algeria. You find them also in this rock art or in circled in yellow. So this might point to um, this migration that I mentioned earlier. It might be the case that uh, squash were used as churns in temperate climates. Uh, the, there was a temperate climate in the Sahara at the moment of Iheren. This people probably migrated on and off around the whole region with their small cattle and perhaps established uh, themselves there. Um, and then when aridification happened, uh, people used goat skin more and then 
you had this shift to another type of churning, churning method and churns. So the Sahara now, um, white plants and famine foods. There are, in, in this region, in the southern Sahara, the Kel Ahaga, they uh, are able to name 464 white plants. Uh, among which 80 are edible and a dozen only grow in sufficient quantities to really um, be eaten as regular food. I'm taking here the example of the uh, tawit, <coughs> which grows on Rocky Mountain slopes, is used for animal pasture but also as food. So the preparation is the following. The plant is cut, dried in the sun, then threshed threshed on a piece of cloth, then the little round black shiny seeds are winnowed and kept in a leather bag. And whenever it is found, it's collected and kept for moments of, um, for hard, hardship moments. And the inhabitant of Videles, which is a city around the Hoga, said they only survived, uh, a village rather than a city, they only survived thanks to Tewit seeds during the 1950 famine, so it's a very important um, food for them. The preparation is the following. The seeds are winnowed on a plated vessel, then pounded in a wooden mortar with a little water, then mixed with wheat and then triturated on a grindstone. Then the mixture is humidified with water, kneaded into a small round flat dough and cooked on sand and embers. In the north, uh, People also, Berbers also use extensively wild plants uh, to this day. You have here uh, three examples. Um, Tehya on the right, which is used in couscous sauce, Tsiksun Teges Tehya, or with meat, Teges Wiksun, and Ilus um, Ufunes, which means the tongue of beef, or beef tongue, is used in the traditional recipe Tevezint, which I'm going to talk about a little bit further. And you have also uh, acorns. Uh, some of them, so Avaloth is a, the generic term, but the, the one that people use is the sweet one. It's first dried, then ground into flour and mixed with barley and wheat. wheat. Uh, to make couscous, which is called ahthout. But then, in times of famine, another acorn, which is uh, more um, acid, is also uh, used, but it has to be first retted in water, then ground. And you also have couscous made of it, which is called afrsir. And this one is very difficult to digest, but of course, in times of famine, uh, you have to. So in the Sahara and in the north, famine food actually apparently builds on ancient knowledge of hunter-gatherer diet, um, preserved in some recipes which are endangered. Um, also another point which is of interest regarding those types of uh, foods is wild grains, which might have been at the origin of the couscous preparation, which I'm going to talk about also later. Uh, there is a current, current interest in the revival of those ancient recipes for health reasons uh, from people who are aware of um, health issues. But conversely, there are also memories of famines which are still vivid and people tend to look at, on, down on those foods as foods that, that remind them of hard times. So there can be also negative attitudes to those foods. So a little bit of... Uh, Berber, I hope. So you can read the translation. Okay, so you can see that uh, 
women are totally aware of uh, the change in diet and the big problems that are arising due to the introduction of new types of food, which is underway at the moment. So this is also why it's important to document food uh, practice um, in the Berber area. So farming food in proverbs, uh, you some uh, I was uh, talking about the negative attitudes to famine foods. This is one example. Uh, so fi or wild cardoon, now fava beans are ripe. So meaning, uh, okay, once when you were hungry, you were happy to have fega. Now you only want fava beans because times have changed and you... you so of course, proverbs can apply to a number of situations, but it's interesting that it's, this one is based on food uh, comparison. And this is uh, the case for a lot of food terms um, and elements of culture. Um, in oral literature, you can find food vocabulary and reference to food in a number of uh, oral literature genres. I'm going to give you an example with a riddle here. So maybe you can uh, guess it. Thletha bub tariult, tariult bub zirea. So it means three carry a female donkey on their back. The female donkey carries seeds on her back. Would you guess what this refers to? So I'm giving you a hint. <laughs> yeah, three is the, the tripod on the three stones of the heart. And then, so the, the answer of, of the riddle is Indian Tesksu So the three elements which are in the picture. Indian is the three stones of the heart. Then Thesksus is the pot with which one steams a couscous. This is what is referred to by the female donkey. Why? Because probably of the um, phonological and morphological um, structure of the word. Tariul Thesksus, with the same vocalic pattern. And then Thesksu, uh, the couscous. And here you have, well, two syllables, but also probably the uh, relationship between the term seed and the couscous. So, and there are several riddles that revolve around food, and the riddles are used for the education of children. Food in folk tales. There's, uh, so this is an example of a folk tale that you can find in the corpus that Nick was mentioning at the beginning, which is uh, down there. A widower has seven daughters. A neighbor tricks the girls into convincing their father to marry her. Then she forces the father to eliminate his daughters. After several ordeals, the girls survive, thrive, forgive their father, and poison their stepmother. So uh, there are a few uh, references to food, which, has, which I think are very important in the folktale. One of them is when the widower, at the very beginning, refused to remarry until the youngest of his daughters is able to reach Arum Gudukwen, so the, the um, flat bread, which is basic food on the shelf. So you understand that this means that she has to take care of her, be able to take care of herself, because it's the little girls who, pressed by the neighbor, ask their father to remarry. And he says, no, 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 I won't marry until uh, little uh, Fatima is able to reach the bread on the shelf. So I'm not playing the sounds because I'm afraid will take too much time, but if you wish, I can do it later. Then forced by his wife to throw his daughters into a deep pit so that they die, he tells them they have to go to their uncle's wedding with baskets of offering. The girls take the baskets with them into the pit. They eat it. A week passes, and then they start starving, and the elder sister suggests they eat the youngest. So they say, she says, oh, we're hungry, we have to eat you, we want to eat your flesh. So it's very mm, <laughs> cruel and direct. <coughs> so she, the little one, she cries, she shed tears, and a fava bean tree sprouts so they can eat. Then they are thirsty, uh, they want to drink her blood. Uh, she sheds tears, and then a fountain of fresh water appears, and they can drink. And then they, uh, the little girl manages to go out to the pit and then goes to the mountain 
cat's house, and so on. So they, on, the, on their way, at some point, they meet, in the folktale, they meet two creatures which were present in the area um, 50 years ago, still, and now uh, the lion is extinct, but this is north of Algeria. Uh, but the mountain cat is, can still be seen in some places. So the mountain cat is a shepherd who lives in a house full of figs, wheat, milk, etc. Plenty of food given by neighbors, but he's a Scrooge and only eats unrefined bran bread. The girls kill him, take over his who, house and cook in it. So this, episode, this whole episode is um, really about how to behave regarding food. They also meet the Lion of the Mist and Wind, who wants to eat the girls, and the eldest sister uh, presents her right breast to the lion, and this refers to co-lactation practice, which was a way to integrate people into the tribe. So it's also something which is important in the education of children. Finally, still in this the same folktale, which is about 15 minutes long, uh, there are several mentions of Thirifin, which you can see on the bottom left, a type of can pancake which is associated with mourning and death. Um, the stepmother prepares them when she thinks the girls are dead in the pit. Uh, the little girl prepares them at the mountain cat's house, um, and he kills himself by thrusting a burning stick into his own nostrils, and they also prepare some from their, for their stepmother but they put poison in it, and so the stepmother dies. So in Kabik folktale, folk tales, food educates children about the symbolic meaning and cultural use of some recipes and preparations, the importance of food as indication of civilized versus uncivilized status around cannibalism and things like that. And it's linked to domestication, sedentarization, and perhaps there are here traces of uh, memories of an ancient shift from pastoralism to agriculture. This is a recurring motif in Kabyl folk tales. Now, food in saying and formulas. There is a, an important saying in um, Kabyl, which is an al-mulh. We will share thagula um, and salt. Well, let's share thagula and, and salt, uh, which means let's trust each other, let's unite. And tegula in Kabyle uh, means high quality flour or food carrying symbolic load. Uh, it's not really cooked as a recipe no longer in Kabyle in the north, but in some other Berber languages it's a common preparation. So the question is what variation is there in the huge Berber speaking area concerning this uh, preparation? So tegula, uh, you can see that it, it appears in the whole area under a different uh, names, so all cognates, tegula, teglali, tegula, tegula, etc. Uh, it's probably an ancient preparation, and you can find several indications of the way it's prepared in um, dictionaries or ethnographic texts. Uh, in Foucault's dictionary, in the Ahaga, uh, he says that um, you mix this flour and water, and then you put it, you dig a hole in the sand, you put ashes, embers, and then you put this preparation, and then you heat it with, um, with herbs. Um, you put fire to a bunch of herbs and you heat it, and then you cover with sand and embers, and it becomes a kind of bread that you can see on the, at the bottom and in the middle of the slide. In other areas, such as Radames or in South Morocco, it's another kind of preparation. It's more like a porridge kind of preparation. Which it, so it has the same name, but it's a different preparation. And of course, the, so it's, it stays uh, more or less liquid, or it's not cooked as bread. So the question there is, what is the most traditional preparation? Is it the soft dough? Is it the bread? It happens that we know that in uh, Niger, so the southernmost Tuaregs, this preparation is cooked not in the sand and with embers as bread, but in, the, in water. So it's more like the porridge uh, stuff that we saw earlier. Also, if we look at that cognate, 
uh, over the whole area, we see that it refers to a capacity measure, measure for cereals, handful of grain that you put in the hole at the milk of, of the grinding mill. You see that on the on the right, the, the, the two photos on the on the bottom right. So probably this route which uh, doesn't exist anymore really as a as a verb, uh, as a frequent verb, is to put a handful of grain in the hand mill. And um, this points to, as well as the shape of the preparation, points <laughs> to probably the dough as being more ancient than the bread preparation. Uh, so here I can uh, show you the, um, the way those different preparations are found over the whole territory. So the measure of flour and water made into soft dough cooked like porridge. You can see it's all over this area with uh, red stars. Then you have, when it's cooked uh, as bread in ashes and sand, it's in more arid zones. It's the green um, stars. And the preparation, when the, this preparation becomes to comes to mean not either of this, those two dishes, but something more abstract, symbolic, and so on. This is in that area. So there are some semantic shifts concerning this recipe. But in this case, uh, there's no correlation between subgroup and food preparation. Uh, but the question I asked myself was, was were there food-related terms that mapped onto linguistic subgroupings, contrary to Fegula? And is in particular one group within northern Berber, the Zanati group, which is remarkable linguistically because it has a lot of linguistic innovations. Its geographical span is extremely wide. It's historically mentioned as very nomadic. Uh, and it, ha it is characterized also by some lexical innovations. So you can see that within the group of northern Berber languages, it's the one that's circled in the middle, and it's the darker blue areas on the map. They are identified historic historically as coming probably from uh, the Nazamans. It's the uh, purplish circle in Libya, Cyrene Cyrenaica. Uh, they're uh, then identified in Roman sources and the Lewatae in Tripolitania, and also by Arab sources later in time uh, under the name Luwata between the Ores Mountains and the Wasinis, that's the blue uh, circle. So this covers um, a good part of the zone where nowadays the Nati languages are spoken. Uh, dog consumption is condemned as impure by mainstream Islam, but it's been practiced in some areas of uh, Tamazra since before the arrival of the Phoenicians. Uh, several Arab travelers mention this dog consumption. They say that it, they are fed with dates only, they are cooked with their skin, and then skinned. The bones are used for medical preparations. Um, the clay dishes where they are cooked, they're only used for dog meat. You cannot cook other types of meat in it. And they're cooked with hot spices and served with couscous. It was still consumed in the 1950s. Uh, it's supposed to cure malaria, help women gain weight. They're given to children at the moment of weaning. And an interesting thing is that it uh, appears to overlap with the Zenati area. So there probably are some, I think that's where the term proxies can be used for uh, relationship between uh, ling linguistic group and um, food consumption. Uh, as far as couscous is concerned, the situation is a bit more complex, but also very interesting. So first of all, I would like to go through the um, preparation. Um, there are two steps and identical everywhere. You prepare first the semolina, by grinding humidified wheat or barley into different millings, so into semolinas, a coarse and a fine semolina. Then you take the coarse one, you add water, you add fine semolina, you roll, then you add flour, and then you roll, 
and then you sieve, and you obtain round grains of various sizes, and this is the couscous. And then you separate grains according to size, which have separate now names, seksu, verkuke, sebelbul, depending, and this is in Kabil, but of course the names are also different in various areas. Then for cooking the couscous, you um, either take the seksu, for instance, the small grains, and steam it three times, or you take the cookies, which is the coarser couscous, and you can boil it in sauce, so there are many preparations. Here is an example of the first stage of the preparation. So you just focus on the gestures um, here, and she shows that she uses a sieve. This one has larger holes in it, and so she will, and you can see on the background one of her sisters kneading dough. So this is the kind of in-situ documentation of food that is um, that can be can be done, and the mother explains the whole thing from behind. So um, so I'm not going to play the whole sequence, but where well, you can see how she does. This is an important phase of the preparation: the way she moves her hand in the sieve. And interestingly, I, you remember this famine food I was talking about a few slides uh, earlier, where you used um, plated um, vessel to roll the, those grains, which are not pre-prepared, but they're actually the, the seeds that were taken from that wild plant, tawit. Um, it, in some regions, in some Berber regions, people don't use sieves anymore. They, uh, they don't use sieves, sorry, because this is a, an innova innovation, but they still use those um, vessels. And I can show you, so the gesture, and this is also important for... So she puts the semolina, this is only part of the preparation, and she does like this on the vessel, which is exactly the same kind of gesture and preparation as with, as with wild grains. So you remember that I told you that one hypothesis is that couscous originated from southern um, Tamazra and possibly even from uh, below the Sahel regions. Western Africa, so it's um, something which can be supported by studies on uh, this kind of gestures um, and um, utensils. Couscous is known under different names according to the region, so uh, now to linguistics, is one cognate more ancient? Does the variation in the recipe name correlate with linguistic subgrouping? Once again, it, does it correspond to the Zenati zone? So all those questions I'm asking myself are based on a working hypothesis, which is that a preparation is a cultural construct with a name and a complex reference, which is its composition. And we have to look at the con convergence or divergence between the name and the composition. And this may help us understand a few things about contacts, intra verbal contacts, and migrations and things. So the a what I call the A-type is when the uh, recipe is a cognate name and that has the same composition. So I consider that in this case, it's uh, probably retention from ancient cultural pra practice and corresponds to conservative linguistic zones. Uh, when the cognate, when there are cognate names, but the composition is different, maybe it's a difference in ecosystem, or maybe there has been a semantic shift. If uh, you have different cognates with the same composition, then it might be innovation, contact. So those are um, questions that um, I think are worth asking ourselves when we tackle the language of food. So one example with couscous, it has uh, various names in the area. The most uh, widespread 
terms are the ones in orange, dark orange and light orange, so suksu and so on, and uh, kisksu, so you have the, the, um, uh, two, the first two uh, actually are the same root. So they span the whole area, but you also have uchu in green, which is used in those areas that you see with the green stars. You also have uh, Arabic loans, ta'am, which means, so uchu means, uh, is the root which means um, eat. It's the same root as the basic term, verb eat. Ta'am is the, also the term in Arabic which means food, meal, food, so it's the meal par excellence. And you have um, a, a place uh, wh where I do my field work, we're on a very endangered language in Tugult, which uh, uses the verb bezin, which normally refers to another uh, type of preparation um, elsewhere. So uh, if we, this is the Zenati zone, um, you have a number of various terms used in the Zenati zone, which could indicate that uh, there has been a lot of contacts and, and intra-migrations, but also outside of that zone to the east. So it's more of a zone which encompasses parts of the Zenati and parts of Eastern Berber and in terms of subgroupings. And this points to possible Zenati Eastern Berber contacts, which is one hypothesis which uh, ba is based on uh, linguistic um, factors, such as the fact that there are shared innovations, uh, but which can perhaps also support be supported by uh, this food um, vocabulary or food lexicon studies that we have presented with my colleague Valentina Schiatterella at uh, each show in uh, July. So we need to gather more uh, data to, in order to really support uh, or investigate those uh, things. We cannot only rely on uh, dictionaries because they will not tell you exactly what the recipe is. Um, it, and there are a lot, there's a lot of information that's missing from there. Uh, but more in situ field work is difficult because the area is not a very easy area to travel in. Uh, and the situation for food terms is actually more complex than what it looks like. So I presented, um, what, what I presented so far is um, data from um, uh, large areas. But if you zoom in smaller areas, that's Kabylie, you can see that this is a, this is a, um, an excerpt from uh, a dialectometric analysis of uh, the dialects of Kabylie. And you can see that already with the liquid L, you have uh, a degree of variation, so five possible realizations. And this is also true for food terms of the vegetable couscous in Kabylie, depending on villages and tribes. It's called, it's called amokful, tarfel, tamoklor, timoklat, tafurot, silzmirt. So it's uh, quite varied here as well, and uh, in a kind of fractal way, because sometimes you find in the, um, in the dialectal small zone terms that are used elsewhere in the bigger Tamazai zone. So this is also, I think, very interesting um, for linguistic studies. So how to do this uh, crowdsourcing? Uh, one possibility that um, I started investigating uh, in 2016 in, um, at one of the coedal workshops uh, to which I was invited for the corpus part of my work, uh, we worked on um, devising an app uh, which was called Zahwa and presented that at ICLDC with colleagues from Melbourne University. Uh, then it didn't quite work and I uh, took the project uh, to work on it with a Berber developer in 2018, uh, renamed it Inyan. Uh, the idea of this new app is that there's no text, it's an image only app. It has geolocalization and a profile and it's based on a bundle of 
uh, photos plus recordings, which are shared by a link or an upload. Another idea for crowdsourcing would be to adapt the 50 words. So I, this is just from discussions I had uh, 10 days ago with Nick Tiberger in uh, Melbourne. Uh, this would be interesting, except that it has to be adapted because the food lexicon only gives it translations. We, need to, we, we cannot work on translation. We need to know about the composition of the recipe. So the added value of an app is, of course, the, its portability inside a smartphone. You can carry one, your own recipe. You can record family recipes. It's also linked to well-being, identity. So it, you, you can also share horizontally, horizontally, not necessarily in a top-down way. So this is important. Uh, and you can do self-documentation, which builds agency and capacity among speakers. The drawbacks is, of course, bugs for any one of you who's worked with apps. That's really the big problem. So I'm saying a few words about the app scenario. Uh, Taos is a young woman. She's starting college. She's homesick and would like to cook the traditional recipes her grandma Zahua used to cook for her. Thankfully, she has her app where she has her grandma's voice explaining her recipe in Kabil. She sets the app and starts gathering the ingredients, and she's feeling happy. Last spring, she went to the village for a few days and asked her grandma for her damaput recipe. They set up the ingredients. Taos took photos of all the stages while her grandmother cooked the recipe, as well as the final picture of the dish. Then, in front of warm coffee, they went through the photos, selected the ones they considered the best, and Taos recorded her grandma explaining the ingredients, utensils, and stages of the recipe in Kabyle. Then she took a picture of Zahwa and set up her profile for future recipes. Remember that women of that generation, they're illiterate. Um, so she uploads the recipe, keeps a copy on her phone, and shares the recipe online. And now every th time she wants to cook it, she has her grandma's recipe, her voice, her gestures. So she speaks her language fluently, even though she's bilingual in Arabic now, but she's happy to listen to her grandma's speech, especially as uh, her grandma added information about the significance of this dish in the culture. But Ines is not so lucky. She was born in France 16 years ago. Her parents haven't spoken to her in Kabyle because they thought this would help her integrate. She can understand the language, but feels insecure speaking it. She's so happy that her cousin Taos sends her, grand sends her their grandma's recipe. She can learn the language of food and be fluent, at least in the kitchen. And this makes things easier with her mother, who can be so annoying at times when she says, Ines, come on, go to such and such party. Her mom, who is also interested in recording her own recipes in Kabyle now. So this is to show how important this could be for maintenance, language maintenance, and well-being. This is an example of Tamakfut, that recipe I just uh, mentioned, and the way the um, photos can be um, arranged with uh, recording. So I'm just going through the photos, arrange the vegetables, then put it <coughs> to steam. When the semolina is half steam, you drench it with water, let the water drain put the couscous back, add some coarse salt, eliminate the lumps by rubbing the couscous between your hands. And this is a gesture which is um, special. S some people might not know it, so uh, the, there's a possibility in the app to have small clips. Uh, it's important not to have big videos because then it's impossible to upload this in those areas. So, But small clips are okay. I'm going to show this to you and maybe this will also remind you of something. So this is what we do with the couscous to eliminate the lumps in between um, the two steamings of the grain. And this, um, I think gestures are also very important because you can see that there are some recurring gestures of uh, like this, the ones you saw for the preparation of the grain, this one for the, the, the um, taking away the lumps between the two steamings. Um, so it's good to have um, this kind of data crowdsourced. Then you put the couscous back on the fire to steam, and when it's cooked, you put it back into a, the large dish and eliminate the last lumps, adding olive oil and coarse salt. Um, and you serve it with vegetables on top, provide olive oil and salt for those who'd like to add some. 
So that's an example of a recipe that could be crowdsourced with photos and recordings uh, following the scenario. So the idea for this project is to collect data for cross-linguistic comparison and reconstruction uh, by having the name of the dish and, and so on the preparation. This is, uh, I was so happy when I came across this uh, book uh, by Ross, Pauli and Osmond because it shows how important um, culture, material culture is for all those linguistic questions and it doesn't have to be separated into anthropology on the one side and linguistics on another side and this is something that you do so well here in Australia, having both things together and it's not always the case um, elsewhere in the world. So collecting this kind of data through an app and other means, uh, 50 words, a website, in situ field work and so on, would be very interesting. Also, auto-documentation -doc centered around food uh, allows the empowerment of women, which is a very um, important issue um, at the moment for the whole of North Africa. I think it's, it's very crucial. Uh, it also, because also, I mean, because they are women, but also because they are the ones who know about culture and those traditions. Um, so if we don't allow them to do it, then we will lose all this very quickly. Um, preserving language and culture, also it, it has a potential auto-documentation for revitalization in the case of food in a delimited domain, so it's very efficient. If you want to relearn or reconnect with a language and you have to learn the whole language, then people, it's too difficult. But if you focus on learning how to talk about cooking, then you do something pleasant, something connected with your ancestry, and the uh, part of the language that you can use is smaller, so it's more, um, I think easy to implement and of course it promotes healthy eating because all those recipes they're quite healthy and the connection to ancestry is uh, provides well-being creates well-being so f conclusions food is a strong component of culture uh, it can be worked on through anthropology you can find it in oral literature it takes a part in education it's also important in linguistics because you can study cognates of food terms, but also the composition of recipe and how it um, connects with uh, the cognates themselves. So as if we would be studying the intention of a concept and its reference, semantic shifts, innovations and so on. So the whole methodology can be built around this. Um, it's at the intersection of language, culture and history. You can reconstruct migrations uh, for instance, through uh, food vocabulary um, and food culture. And as uh, I mentioned at the end of the presentation, it can also be a nice way of conserving and revitalizing uh, the language through an app, for instance. Thank you, and my thanks to all the Berber women who shared their knowledge with me all those years. Thank you.